This little boy is referred to as Sam in case studies. A year and a half before he was born, his grandfather died. When he was about 18 months old, his dad was changing his diaper one day, and, and Sam looked up at him and said, when I was your age, I used to change your diaper. Since 1996, Dr. Jim Tucker, a psychiatrist at the University of Virginia, has been gathering case studies of past life recognition in children that could prove that a soul returns to Earth in another body. We've now got 2,500 cases in our files from all over the world. Many people believe in some form of reincarnation. The concept dates back to 800 BC and the Hindu Upanishads. Beginning in India, the belief that some essential part of ourselves may return after death to a new body is now being examined by some scientists as another way to prove the survival of consciousness. Can the study of past life recollections support this theory? The answer may lie within young children's memories. Very young children, usually between the age of two or three, who start reporting that they have memories from having had a past life. Some of them talk about being deceased relatives, but others will talk about being strangers in other locations. And if they give enough details, like the name of the other location, people have often gone there and found that, in fact, someone had died in, in the recent past whose life matches the details that the children gave. The late psychiatrist Dr. Ian Stevenson advanced the field of reincarnation research in the 1960s, interviewing over 3,000 people who claimed to have past life memories. Two-thirds of them said that in a previous life, they died from unusual causes. He focused on 25 cases in India and realized that young children talking about past lives was much more common than anyone had known. Dr. Stevenson created categories to screen for cases worthy of further study. His colleague, Jim Tucker, still uses this method. The criteria we use to decide whether to register a case um, would include two of, of the following characteristics, a prediction of rebirth, an announcing dream, a birthmark or birth defect that seems related to the previous life, uh, statements of memories about the previous life, uh, behaviors that seem related, and then also recognitions of people or places from that life. Sam's story is an example of how a small child may express what some believe are memories of a previous life. When Sam was four, four and a half, his grandmother died, and his father went out to take care of her belongings. Uh, when he came back, he brought a group of family photos, which before that, Sam's family had not had any of his father's family photos in the house. One night, Sam's mom had them spread out on the coffee table looking at them. When Sam came over and started pointing to pictures of his grandfather. Mommy, where did these come from? Those are pictures Daddy brought back from Grandma's funeral. That's my car. See that picture? It turned out that that was the grandfather's first new car and one that he was, was very attached to. His parents had had no belief in reincarnation. In fact, his mother was the daughter of a Southern Baptist minister. Sammy, come talk to mommy for a minute. It's just a coincidence. Sam's mother became intrigued by her son's statements. She started testing him with questions about his grandfather. She showed him a class photo of when his grandfather was in grammar school. Sammy, do you recognize anyone in this photo? There I am. Now, Sammy, that's your grandpa when he was a boy. No, that's me. When I looked at the picture, even after having looked at the other pictures of his grandfather, I really would not have been able to say with any certainty which boy I thought was the grandfather. And, and of course, Sam was four at the time that he did this. Some children not only remember their past life, but the afterlife as well. About 20% of the children will describe events between the time when the previous person died and, and when the child was born. Uh, some of them describe basically sort of hanging out either where the previous person lived or where the previous person died. Um, so they may describe their funeral. 
Then there are other children who talk about going to other realms like heaven, things like that. Uh, some of them will talk about seeing other beings there or talking with God. I died and shot up to heaven. God gave me a ticket that let me come back down to earth. This is not part of our everyday experience of people talking about past lives. If the children are able to describe memories that then turn out to be accurate for somebody who lived and died in the past, then this suggests that memories or something connected with memories can carry over uh, possibly after the death of the body. I've had a number of, of friends and acquaintances who have said that their children when they were two or three would make one sort of unusual statement. Uh, like there's one woman who said her, her child said, in my last life I drove a big truck. This was as they were riding down the road one day, never said anything else. And you know, you don't make too much of that. But in these cases, the children don't stop after one or two statements. When children continue to talk about having had a past life, they may offer more specific details. Do you remember your family? Some people turned my sister into a fish. Who turned her into a fish? Some bad guys. She died. The father had only recently heard about the sister being murdered 60 years before and then her body had been dumped in the bay and he felt absolutely certain that the boy had never heard about it. Some people point out what they believe to be flaws in Tucker's studies. How do we know all these things actually happened? That is, the boy said this, he pointed there. Um, I mean, I presume these are anecdotes and stories told by the parents recounted to the author uh, who then writes them down. We know from research on memory, from research on uh, how much uh, parents influence their children um, and the reconstruction of events and how unreliable that is, exactly how that can be distorted. Some people have argued that it's the parents' enthusiasm for a case that makes it stronger than it really is. Uh, so one of the things we code for is the parents' uh, initial attitude about a case. And, and when I looked, I found that in fact the initial attitude has no correlation whatsoever with how strong the case ultimately appears to be. Memories aren't the only signs of a former life. In Dr. Tucker's cases, a more rare occurrence is when physical characteristics carry over from one body to another, from one life to the next. In a number of our cases, the child is born with a birthmark or a birth defect that matches a wound, usually a fatal wound, on the body of the previous person. This is something that's fairly common. Most of these are not the usual blemishes that that a lot of people have, but they can be um, quite specific or unusual markings. There's a little boy in Thailand named Chloe. When his grandmother was dying, she expressed a wish to come back as a man. And then when she died, her daughter-in-law took some white paste and ran her finger down the back of the neck of, of the body. Um, then Chloe was born a few years later and had this white mark on the back of his neck that looked just like someone running a finger down the back of his neck. Then when he got old enough to talk, he talked about having been his grandmother, um, said how the, her rice field belonged to him and, and made statements like that. A common practice in several Asian countries involves marking the dying relative with soot or paste. When the soul is reincarnated, the family can recognize its rebirth by this mark. Certainly, I think the birthmarks and birth defects argue that there is something that has carried that trauma with it to another life and then affected the fetus. Of Tucker's 2,500 cases, more than 2,000 of them involved violent or unusual deaths. His data suggests that physical trauma in one life can carry over that the mind can remember past violence and inflict it on a new body. There's a famous case of a man who relived an event where he was tied up and, and developed what looked like rope marks on his arm. So there are examples of, of mental images producing very specific marks on the body. What are the conclusions that Dr. Tucker draws from this intriguing data? 
but I think the uh, best explanation for our strongest cases is that memories, emotions, and even physical traumas sometimes can carry on from one life to another. The explanation for how this carryover occurs largely remains to be elucidated, but in general terms, the idea is that consciousness is not purely a, a creation of the brain, so consciousness could be considered a separate entity um, from the physical brain and then could continue on in another life. The idea of reincarnation sets up a number of possibilities regarding the existence of the soul. Survivors of clinical death may also provide a glimpse into what happened after death.